بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو تشالنجينج يا دي المفتاح يا فعلا انا عملت المحاضره دي حصاد اوقات صعبه بقى بينها واعتقد كلنا من قابلينها من تاع عيان شاب صغير جاي يعمل كيدني ترانسبلانتيشن ان يو تيك هيستوري ان دو بايوبسي وتفاجئ انك بتتعامل مع عيان برايمري هايبر اوكسانوريا فرستريشن فرستريشن تو يو از دكتور اند تو ذا فاميلي وات تو ساي وات تو دو Uh, is there is a gap for this frustration? Is there is a gap for this complex problem? Uh, this is actually the target of this lecture. I hope I will succeed to find a gap with you. Uh, first, we know that primary hyperoxanuria or oxanurias are rare inborn error of glyoxanate metabolism characterized by the overproduction of oxanate. which is poorly soluble and is deposited as calcium oxanate in various organs, not only the kidney. If we come to genetics, it is complex. I'm going to try it as simple as I can. Uh, we know that primary hyperoxanuria is primarily caused by autosomal recessive variant in three genes for the three types uh, of primary hyperoxanuria that encode enzyme involved in glyoxanate metabolism. These pathologic variants result in enhanced oxanate production. As oxanate is typically excreted in the urine, the kidney is the prime target of excessive oxanate deposition, resulting in nephrocarcinosis and kidney stone, and in some cases, end-stage kidney disease. This is the patient who always we face and feel frustrating and asking, searching for a gap. I'm not going to this uh, uh, com complex, but I will say that there are three types of hyperoxanosis. Hyperoxanosis prime, uh, number uh, type one, in which there is uh, 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 abnormality or mutation in the gene alanine glyoxanate aminotransferase, which is present in the berxosome of the liver. This is type one. Uh, type uh, uh, two, uh, which is present to defect or mutation in a gene which secrete uh, protein or enzyme in the cytoplasm of the cell. Uh, this is called glyoxanate reductase hydroxybiridine reductase uh, gene or enzyme. Uh, the third type or hyperoxanuria type one, the defect is in the mitochondria. Uh, there is a defect in the mutation gene, HOGA gene, uh, all these uh, mutations will result in excess oxygenate uh, production uh, due to this defect in the hepatocytes. Uh, if we come to uh, primary hypoxanuria type 1, it is due to a variant in uh, AGXT gene that encodes the hepatic peroxisomal enzyme alanine glyoxygenate aminotransferase. Uh, this is a paradoxal, this is very important, this point, paradoxal, 5-phosphate-dependent uh, uh, enzyme, so vitamin B6 can help in some cases of this type 1, which is involved in the transamination of glyoxanate to glycine. This important error of metabolism leads to an increase in glyoxanate pool, which is converted by lactate dehydrogenase into oxanate. So again, oxalate and glyoxalate. This is important to differentiate it from type 2 and type 3. It is uh, the most common, this type 1, uh, high, uh, uh, primary hypoxanuria, uh, and accounts for approximately 70 to 80% of cases which we see in our clinic. It is uh, the most severe form uh, with more rapid progression to kidney dysfunction, and the development of end-stage kidney disease in one half of patient by young adulthood. We have to know there are more than 190 variants have been identified in this gene, which are found in all 11 exons of the gene. So not only mutation, but there are many variables. This will explain the variability in the clinical presentation and outcome. If you come to type 2, uh, it is due to variance 
of glyoxalate relactase, hydroxybiridine relactase that encodes for a cytosol. Here, here cytosolic, the other in, in the peroxisome. Cytosolic enzyme, glyoxalate reductase, hydroxybiruvate reductase, which uh, normally convert glyoxalate to glycolate. It accounts for approximately 10% of cases. Unlike uh, type 1, this enzyme, although predominantly expressed in the liver, has a wide tissue distribution. Pathologic variants, there is also variance in this gene result in increased amount of glyoxalate and hydroxybiruvate, which are converted by lactate dehydrogenase into oxalate and N-glycerate. Here, this, if you are going to look for the urine, this N-glycerate will differentiate type 1 from type 2. Um, these metabolites are excreted in excessive amount in urine, which in the case of oxalate lead to recurrent kidney stone. More than 40 mutations have been described and include uh, deletion, insertion, missense, nonsense mutation. If we come to type 3, uh, it is due to variant in HOGA1 uh, gene uh, enzyme that encode for liver specific mitochondria. Here it is the mitochondria uh, for hydroxy 2 uh, oxano uh, oxoglyphosate. Aldolase enzyme. This enzyme expressed, uh, expressed in the liver and in the kidney uh, is the final step of hydroxyproline uh, degradation pathway within the mitochondria and catalyze the cleavage of uh, this uh, uh, HOGA to bioruvate and glyoxalate. Uh, again, bioruvate. Uh, this type 3 hyperoxaluria uh, 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 is the mildest form of primary hyperoxanuria and appears to account for approximately 5 to 10 percent of genetically character characterized cases. However, the prevalence of, prime, of this type 3 may be greater than previously published uh, uh, clinical studies reported. It is the most recently identified type and less severe, so possibly its uh, distribution is more than we expect. Uh, two additional groups of primary hypoxaluria patients have also been identified, other than type 1 and type 2 and type 3. For all three uh, types, there is variant, variable expression. This is very important sentences, variable expression. So different severity of the disease, even among family members with the same genotype. This, is, this was illustrated in one study that reported differences of greater than 20 years in the onset of end-stage kidney between sibling of in type 1. So if you have a patient with primary hyperoxanuria coming by end stage, uh, apparently his uh, uh, family is free, but they can carry the same gene. Possibly in future, they can be present uh, by stone formation. So uh, for donation, there is a big question. In addition, within families, with type 2 disease expression varies with one affected sibling progressing to end stage, whereas the other sibling only had occasional symptomatic kidney stones. Uh, this is important. Uh, what happened uh, after this oxalate deposition? The increased urinary excretion of oxalate result in urinary calcium oxalate supersaturation in urine which lead to crystal aggregation, kidney stone, and nephrocarcinosis. So it will end by kidney damage. But the story don't finish here. But the more painful uh, uh, part is coming. As kidney function decline, plasma oxygenate level increase, and the calcium oxygenate is deposited into other tissue, resulting in systemic oxygenosis and manifestation uh, uh, outside the kidney. So we say systemic oxalosis when the patient develops uremia. But before that, it is called primary hyperoxanuria. And this example of some oxalate crystal, uh, uh, oxalate crystal, there is this dumbbell shape. This is monohydrate. This is the uh, envelope shape. And there are other crystal form. This is uh, oxalate di dihydrate uh, molecules. Uh, this is the uh, calcium monohydrate. 
calcium oxalate monohydrate uh, stones. Uh, and uh, uh, primary hydroxylure type 1 is the most severe form, as we said. Patients with uh, this type have higher urine oxalate level and higher incidence of nephrocarcinosis than the other two types. In patients with this type 1, urinary oxygenate excretion exceed 1 millimole per 1.7 square meter surface area. Uh, normally, it is half this amount. It is 0.5 uh, per day. The presence of nephrocarcinosis is associated with increased rise in serum creatinine, while the number of stone and stone events don't significantly associated with this risk. So if you have two brothers, one of them nephrocarcinosis, other have recurrent stones, that with uh, nephrocarcinosis will progress to end the stage than his brother with recurrent stone disease. If we come to the epidemiology, I think the, in spite I'm bringing this information from the most version of up to date, I think it needs revision, since I think the instance is more than it is reported as we meet many cases uh, uh, every month or every week. Uh, primary hyperoxaluria is a rare disorder. This type one, which account for approximately 80% of the cases, has an estimated prevalence of between one to three per million in European and American, but he is talking about type one. Type two, type three, and others are not reported. However, this estimation does not account for potential underreporting especially for the less severe type 2 and 3, and uh, may change with the increasing availability of molecular testing. Um, in North America, type 1 is responsible for approximately 1 per 1,000 uh, of cases of CKD in children, and is the primary diagnosis on 1%, 5%, or 0.5% of children who undergo kidney transplantation. If we come to the clinical and the laboratory, age of presentation, the age at presentation is variable because of marked heterogeneity of the disease expression, as I said before. Uh, the median age at diagnosis is approximately 5 to 5.5 years of age, but range from less than one year up to 50 years uh, can, uh, can present. We as nephrons usually see this patient in adolescence age. Uh, kidney manifestation, there are five clinical presentations of primary hyperoxaluria type 1 have been described based on the age of presentation and kidney manifestation. So, uh, uh, an infant, who is usually seen by pediatrician, it represents 26% of cases. Infant generally present before six months of age with nephrocarcinosis and the kidney impairment. We don't see this patient. Children with recurrent kidney stones and rapid decline in kidney function, this represents 30% of cases. Uh, uh, and adult, uh, if the patient reach adulthood and not yet manifest, usually it come by recurrent stone. Um, after transplantation, we see cases. Uh, this 10% of cases of the recurrent oxalosis when it was misdiagnosed, such as patient coming with unknown uh, kidney, uh, uh, indecision kidney disease or, or recurrent stone disease. Now we come to the uh, fifth and the most painful presentation with systemic oxalosis as the glomerular filtration rate falls below 30 to 40 milliliter per minute, bare 1.7 square meter surface area, plasma oxalate level increase. In urine, it decreases, this oxalate, but in plasma, it starts to go up. It increases because of reduction or reduced urinary oxalate excretion. When plasma oxalate excretes 30 micromoon per liter, which is the plasma supersaturation threshold for calcium oxalate, calcium oxalate is deposited into other tissue, including retina, myocardium, vessel wall, skin, bone, and central nervous system everywhere. Uh, if we give more detail about systemic oxalosis, cardiac, cardiac conduction defect that may result in cardiac arrest sometimes, circulation, poor peripheral circulation uh, that result in distant gangrene and difficulties with vascular access for hemodialysis, bone and joint, 
bone manifestations that include the bone pain, uh, erythropoietin resistance, anemia, and an increased risk of a spontaneous fracture due to deposition of oxalate. Oxalate deposition may be seen as a dense supra-metaphysian band uh, on X-ray and are most prominent in the metaphys metaphysis of lung bone and trabecular bone. Osteoarticular manifestations are severe in patients who, who have been on dialysis for more than one year. Oxalate deposition in the joint can lead to synovitis uh, with reduction of mobility and joint pain. Vision oxalate deposition in the retina, retinal epithelium, and the macula can cause diminished uh, visual acuity. Bone marrow oxalate deposition in the bone marrow leading to pancytopenia. Other findings include hypothyroidism, peripheral neuropathy, dental problems, including dental pain, root resorption, bulb exposure, and skin manifestation, including nebido reticularis, peripheral gangrene, and metastatic calcinosis cutis. So, before reaching to this systemic uh, oxalosis, early diagnosis is critical so that intensive medical therapy, which we are going to discuss later on, can be initiated that will delay progression uh, to end stage kidney disease. However, late detection is common and result in a significant number of patients who, are, who have end stage kidney disease at the time of diagnosis, and actually this is what we see. If we come to type two, type two is generally a milder disease and type one as a risk of end stage uh, kidney disease is lower and the kidney function deterioration is slower. Kidney function impairment uh, and CKD approximately one quarter to one third of patients with this type two will progress to end stage. The median age uh, for reaching end stage uh, was a 40 year ranging from 34 to 48 of age, so they are older than type one, which is older than what is typical in type one. Approximately one third of patients maintain normal kidney function and the uh, remainder have evidence of kidney dysfunction. A systemic axonosis patient who progress to end the stage, who also at risk of systemic axonosis, uh, uh, the same as type one retinal deposits, cardiomyopathy, conduction defect, and this thing. So it is like type one, but less severe, uh, less aggressive. Type three, uh, it will be the same, less severe, but it is not well characterized as type one and type two, since it has been reported very recently. Now we come to the very important issue. How can we diagnose? We have to follow stepwise uh, assessment, stepwise diagnostic assessment. The diagnosis of primary hyperoxaluria is made in a stepwise fashion based on, number one, clinical suspicion due to the presence of a clinical manifestation, a child coming by recurrent stone, a child coming by nephrocarcinosis, so we have to expect this. Number two, if we expect, uh, suspect, we proceed to metabolic. Testing demonstrating elevated urinary exonate excretion if it is in the early stage. If in late stage, urinary exonate will not will go down, but serum exonate will go up. So you look for exonate. Okay, you have more strong evidence, so you go, you move to the third step, which is genetic. By confirmation by genetic testing, demonstrating uh, a variant of any of the three known causative genes, AGXT, uh, GR, uh, HPR, and HOGA1. If no variant has been found, diagnosis of primary hypoxia type 1 and 2 can be made by liver biopsy. Still, our tool in the past was liver biopsy, was there no genetic. Now we do genetic, but if it is negative, we can go to liver biopsy if we are proceeding to liver transplant, kidney and liver transplantation. To demonstrate uh, 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 absent or significantly low AGT and uh, GRHPR activity in the liver. Um, regarding clinical suspicion because of the rarity of primary hypoxaluria, a strong clinical suspicion is needed to ensure there is not a delay in diagnosis as the efficiency of treatment, as I will say later on, is dependent on early diagnosis. If you come late, patient come late, no effective treatment except surgery. 
The diagnosis of primary hypoxaluria should be suspected in children and infants with any of the following findings, which is common, I think, in every pediatric urology clinics, but they don't focus on this issue. Recurrent calcium uh, kidney stones, especially in a patient with oxalate crystals in urine sediment, and normal urine calcium and uric acid excretion. Pure calcium oxalate monohydrate in kidney, kidney stones. Nephrocalcinosis, especially if associated with decrease in glomerular and GFR, since uh, a disease uh, such as uh, medullary cystic, uh, medullary sponge kidney, there could be a nephrocalcinosis, but the kidney function is normal for a long time. This is an example uh, envelope shaped is, uh, crystals in urine. And this is a, a kidney biopsy, uh, which shows in light microscopy this uh, uh, calcium uh, oxalate by light microscopy. And we did polarized light microscopy. You can see calcium oxalate can show polarization, but calcium carbonate don't show this uh, polarized light microscopy, this uh, shape for it. Um, now uh, we come to the metabolic testing. Um, uh, increase urinary oxalate execution. A clinical diagnosis rely on metabolic screening that demonstrate markedly increased urine excretion of oxalate. It is greater than 90 milligram per 1.7 meter square area per day, 24 hour urine. Patient with type 1 and 2 have higher urine execution of oxalate with level as high, high as, as one, 135 to 270 milligrams, so very high than the upper limb. Normal urine excrete excretion is then 45. Now we are talking about 100, 200, and this figure. So 24 hour urine exalate is the standard. Plasma oxalate concentration remain normal. So far, the kidney function is normal. But when the GFR go down below, 40 milliliter per minute start to go up. Children, okay. Although the norm, I must be angry. Okay. Okay. In some patients, in some patients, obtaining a 24-hour urine collection is difficult, such as in children, baby especially in infant and small children who are not toilet trained. As a result, oxalate excretion can be evaluated by measuring oxalate creatinine ratio in a spot urine sampling. This is a very important test. But what is the normal? These are the normal values by different age. Of course, we, can, we cannot remember it. You have, we have to have it. But there, these are the normal values of oxalate creatinine uh, ratio. Uh, now we come to the plasma when there is a uh, decrease GFR. Urine oxalate measurements may be falsely low in patients with kidney fu uh, function, with, with, kidney, with uh, kidney insufficiency. Urine oxalate will be low when there is uh, decrease GFR, but plasma start to go up. In this setting, plasma oxalate may be useful as there is an inverse relationship between plasma oxalate and kidney function. And also the same. Okay. Now, differentiating among different types, to differentiate between type 1, type 2, type 3, this will depend on detection of oxalate and other metabolite. Since all three types uh, have elevated urine oxalate excretion, they can be distinguished from one another by assessing urinary excretion of metabolite associated with a specific underlying genetic disease. For example, type 1, you oxalate and glycolate. If you find high level of glycolate with oxalate, it's a type 1. Um, uh, in general, hyperoxaluria plus increased urinary excretion of glycolate is a strongly suggestive but not absolutely diagnostic. You have to go to genetic study of type 1. And this is the normal value of this glycolate excretion. And also, there is a glycolate creatinine ratio. This is there. Now we come to type 2. Remember when I was talking about genetic, it is the N-glyceric acid. When you have high N-glyceric acid with high oxalate, you are dealing with a case of type 2. And also in type 3, you will find hydroxyoxoglutarate beside oxalate. So 
in your by urine we can diagnose oxalosis, barium hyperoxaluria. We can define type one or type two or type three, but definitive diagnosis rely on genetic analysis. And this is the genetic testing. There is a lot of genetic testing, and each test has its advantage and disadvantage. Uh, whole genome sequencing, next generation sequencing, targeted mutation analysis. Uh, so by genetic testing, we can identify. Now we come to the prenatal diagnosis. DNA obtained from chorionic villi or amniotic cells is analyzed for uh, identifying genetic mutation found in the family, allowing detection of affected fetus. If it's type one, possibly this can, uh, can be an indication for a portion, for example. Now we come to the role of nevertheless, which was the main tool in the past. Does it have, uh, still have a role now? Yes. Prior to the availability of genetic testing, the diagnosis of primary hyperoxaluria type 1 and 2 were confirmed by liver biopsy that demonstrated enzyme deficiency, either AGT or uh, GH uh, uh, hydroxybyronin reductase enzyme. If genetic testing is not available or a gene mutation has not been identified in a patient in whom there is strong clinical suspicion for primary hyperoxaluria, Liver biopsy is conf to confirm diagnosis as required prior to liver transplantation. Good. What's the differential diagnosis? Patient with liver carcinosis and stone. The uh, 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 dietary hyperoxaluria, uh, uh, dietary enteric combined. Now, let get some detail. Dietary uh, ongoing excessive oxalate intake due to consumption was food rich in oxalate, such as chocolate, coca, leafy green vegetables, such as rhubarb in Spanish, black tea, nuts, bee nuts, butter, bee nut butter, and starfish fruit. Uh, excess consumption will lead to hyperoxaluria. But to the extent of uh, diagnosis of uh, this primary hyperoxaluria, I will say what is the answer. Uh, now come to the enteric Increased intestinal oxalate absorption associated with fat malabsorption, so excess fat in the colon, due to malabsorptive bariatric surgery or small bowel disease or cystic fibrosis. This excess fat will help absorption of oxalate. Combined etiology, we mean dietary and deficiency of oxalobacter formigenes. This bacteria is a normal inhibitant, one of our gut microbiota normally present, it consume oxalate molecule to obtain energy. So it consume it. Uh, uh, those with recurrent stone, those with uh, primary hyperoxalates could be deficient in this oxalobacter for, for magis, and it is a big story. Uh, Needs special lecture. If two can result in this hyperoxaluria, metabolic screening differentiating the disorder above from uh, this page, we can do uh, metab can, uh, metabolic screening, can diagnose, can differentiate. Although elevated urine oxalate excretion can be seen in patients with excess intake oxalate, dietary, or patient with increased intestinal uh, absorption, short bowel syndrome, or bariatric surgery, uh, these levels are usually typically below one millimole, i.e., below 90 milligram per day which are below the level seen in patients with primary hyperoxanosis. In addition, genetic confirmation of primary hyperoxanuria exclude these disorders. Now, evaluation after diagnosis. We diagnose this patient as primary hyperoxanuria. What are we going to do? Uh, once diagnosis of primary hyperoxanuria has been confirmed, additional evaluation assesses the function uh, uh, of potential affected organ, kidney function, for example, bone marrow, we look for deposits and its a function, thyroid function, e ECG, look for conduction defect, hemoglobin measurement, anemia, respond to erythropoietin. In patient with systemic oxalosis, further evaluation to determine the extent of end organ involvement should include eye evaluation, SNETLAM diagnosis, uh, bone density, determination, electrocardiography, uh, and echocardiography. So now we evaluated 
our patient. What's the next step? Management. This is the challenge. What are you going to do? And is there is a gap for this catastrophe? I am sure. I am sure. Medical management. Medical management is focused on reduction of urinary calcium oxalate saturation. Decrease. Okay. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in management, an us in urinary oxalate production and decrease a crystallization. This through excess fluid, you need three liter urine at least to decrease a uh, saturation. Even in infant, we can put gastric tube and give uh, uh, fluids. Inhibit calcium oxalate saturation by giving potassium citrate. It will prevent this crystallization. You can give also magnesium oxide. You can give neutral phosphate. All these decrease crystallization. So decrease secretion, decrease crystallization. Then also that restriction, but actually you can decrease some decrease in oxalate but it is not uh, sufficient. So don't bother your patient. Bioreduction supplementation. Um, for all patients with type 1, we suggest three to six months trial of high dose bioreduction based on uh, reported cases, is reported combination of bioreduction, neutral phosphate, uh, in early age, cellular application to end stage. So we have to try this B6 level. Okay, and we have limited experience in this. For short for time reason, I will go to paradoxin. How can we use it? What is the dose? Successful or not? If successful, we continue. And now we come to the Numisartan, uh, Numasiran. This is a new drug which can treat primary hypoxemia type one. Numasiran is an RNA interference therapeutic agents that target glycolate oxidase resulting in depletion of the set, uh, uh, super, uh, substrate of the oxalate senses. So it decreases oxalate, a new drug. Our practice, this is the, uh, up to date, is to start Numasiran as a first line treatment in patients with, uh, with confirmed type 1 hyperoxaluria. Numasiran is uh, administered subcutaneously in a dose uh, with based dose, and this is the dose of new myasiron. But the drama is that it is very successful drug uh, and has been approved by uh, uh, FDA, but look to the bottom of this lecture. Annual cost of this medication is estimated by 3,007 uh, uh, dollar, which, is, which uh, of course, this is something uh, analogic. Uh, for it. So we have to wait for generic. Uh, fee in, there are investigation drugs such as Nido Siran, similar to Numa Siran. Oxalobacter formagene is to give it as capsule, big story, successful or not. And I think this is the uh, uh, this is a drug which we are trying to have it. It is an uh, experimental drug. Still been told. It is drug used for treatment of epilepsy and has been found to decrease oxalate production from the liver. And there are some limited reports in animal and human which show it could be successful. And actually, the, in the bottom, there is a phase two clinical trial. And this is the number of the trial is planned to study the effect of this drug in reducing urinary oxalate excretion in patients with primary oxalate. Actually, we tried to have this drug. It is not available in Egypt. We send it, we look for it in Europe, but it's still, it's still expensive. And also, also we are trying to find if there is generic, generic in India or something like that. But if we have it, it will be, it will be a great move in treatment of this patient. Dialysis, uh, I will talk for the time. I will say that intensive dialysis, daily dialysis will not be sufficient to remove the daily production of oxalate. So it gives some help. Even if you combine Hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis in the same patient, it can remove, let us say, 80% uh, of the daily production of oxalate. So still there is oxalate deposition in the tissue. But it is a tool which can help in certain settings. Uh, transplantation, there are different types of uh, transplantation, combined liver and the kidney. 
sequential liver uh, and kidney transplantation, isolated liver, isolated kidney, all these are options. And the pain all have advantage, disadvantage, but as, at the end of the day, it is liver and the kidney transplantation. But other moods have some uh, window to brights. I will not go to these details for sake of time. Uh, and I will come to the, this is an example for recurrent oxalosis in the kidney and bone marrow. Okay, I will come to, this is the last slide, nearly. Is there is a gap? I think there is a gap in this frustration. Number one, U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved this nomasiran as initial syrup for type 1. So there is breakthrough, but it is expensive. Still being told, I think if we have it and we try it, there are some successful trials, uh, and it is not as expensive as nomasiran, could, could be a hope. Also, from up to date, isolated kidney transplantation may be an option isolated in selected patients who are responsive to pyridoxin, uh, such as those with homozygous, this uh, type of homozygous. And actually, we have in our experience, we transplanted nearly 12 cases of uh, uh, primary exalosis, all failed exist, except one. And this one, actually, it was available, B6, and uh, this neutron phosphate, magnesium oxide, uh, potassium citrate, all were given extensively, and actually the patient was living, I found her up to 20 years post-transplantation. But others have been lost. So other, some other patient, you can succeed in them, isolated. Isolated kidney transplantation may be also an option in adult with late onset from the disease. Patient with 40 years and diagnosed oxalosis, you can try with it. And uh, with pre-medication by aggressive dialysis, B6, and this uh, option. So this is an, a, a gap. Intensive dialysis, five-hour daily hemodialysis session, nocturnal hemodialysis, or combination of hemo and peritoneal dialysis is needed to try to match daily oxalate production. But the, in many uh, 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 patients, even intensive dialysis therapy remain inadequate to keep with their daily uh, production. So there are some gaps there, and thank you.